The Bible says, The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. Ah, but thou shalt meditate therein. And what will happen? That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt thou make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Say amen. amen. God bless you. Can have your seat. The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. Mm. Hebrews 4, 12. Again, I want to be very fast. Hebrews 4, 12. We started talking about war, world war, part one. And today is world war two. Not world war as in W-O-R-L-D, but talking about W-O-R-D, word. Word of words. For the word of God is quick. That word quick, some translations you have, living. That means the word of God is living. All I want to do this morning is to call your attention to something. This word of God is living. Now, the Bible says it's powerful. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing asunder even to the soul and spirit joints and marrows and is the discerner of thoughts and intents of art. Listen, you might not exactly have one of the nine gifts of the spirit called the sign of spirits. One of the gifts, listen in the first Corinthians chapter 12, is the sign of spirit. We people are trying to use prophetic stuff and all kinds of things to look for now. If you are a man or a woman of the word of God, you will discern. When the word of God abides in you, it gives you ability to discern. Somehow, the more you fellowship with the word, you can tell whether something is of God or not, even though you are not necessarily operating the discerning of the spirit as a gift. Try. All the nine gifts listed, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, gift of faith, gift of healing, the sign of spirit, prophecy, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. All the nine gifts listed. There is none that you cannot join into when you are acquainted with the word of God. One day, and this will help me to just say what I want to say briefly. Kenneth Egi was praying for some men. And he said that there was a very heavy anointing present. And all of a sudden, the anointing lifted. If you are very conversant with the things of the Spirit, if you are anointed, it's more common with ministers, but there are no ministers who are also anointed. You will notice, I see the anointing as uh, this thing about it. You don't control it, the Holy Spirit does. When it's on you, you are not yourself. But then, it can lift. It always lifts because it cannot be on you for more than a period of time. Because the anointing itself can destroy. The flesh cannot carry, especially at the peak of the anointing. Your flesh can carry for too long. <laughs> the people have experienced it. You can open your eyes for 12 hours all night long and not be able to sleep. When I know your, your energy is heightened, so the Lord, so it goes and it comes because you can't sustain it. Now, the anointing is triggered by many things, but it's at the prerogative of the Holy Spirit. I get what I'm saying. Yes, sir. When he got to this man, wanted to pray for him, he said he just felt that like the anointing just lifted. I said they remove a coat from him. And he said, Sir, sincerely, what I used to pray for those, I can't feel it anymore. But I know something that does not go and come. Yeah, yeah. And I said, that is the word. Yes, yes, yes. Listen to me. I can pray for the sick under the anointing and something happens. But you see, you can't depend on that because that is connected to many factors. At times, worship can affect it. Anointing is atmosphere sensitive. Yes, 
but see the word works atmosphere or no atmosphere. Yeah. The word might take a bit of time. There was a man who said he had a growth here physically on his neck, and this will live to one. And he began to say, The word of God is sharper than any two edged sword. He will put it and say, In Jesus' name, I caught you. I caught you. It did not happen in one day. One day he went to bedroom as he entered. He just saw like the growth. He fell off. And the shape on that looked like they used a chisel to chisel it. Because the word of God is sword. The word we live in here is dark. And there are barriers on your way. Everywhere you turn. You need the word of God to make headway for yourself. That's why Hebrews 11. Let's read. Are you following me? <laughs> and then we go to Hebrews 13. Right? Hebrews 11. The Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. But we are going in verse 2. For by it the elders obtain a good report. Who are the elders? Now verse 3. <laughs> Through faith, we understand that the words, everybody say, my word. You know, People will get in trouble and say, welcome to my world. Yes. There was a man, his wife was, we used to tell the friend how not his wife was. So they came on one day and she insulted all of them. And they were sure, he said, welcome to my world. And that was, <laughs> that's a bad word. That's where I'm living. Now, now the Bible said the words were framed by the word of God. Please pay attention here. Someone's life is changing. So that things which are seen. We're not made of things we do appear. In other words, the most powerful raw material is the word of God. Yes, I get what I'm saying. Yes, that you, you don't need things that are visible to create visible things. If you have the invisible word, you have enough material to create something visible. Yeah. So the Bible is saying there that everything you are seeing, including you, God did not make you from any material. God only used one raw material, which is called the word. The Bible said the art, the words were framed. That word framed there, if you look at Hebrew Greek, it says chisel. Aye. It's like how tailors will take a cloth and cut it to the shape. Now, the same material, the same material that this brother is wearing, when it was raw, someone else could give it to a tailor and your tailor can chisel it to a native. Can chisel it to native trouser. Or can chisel it to a suit. Using scissors to cut and cut. The Bible is saying that when you arrive this scene called the word and the word around you. Listen to me. The word is neither good nor bad. It depends on who is looking at it. And it will be unto you what you call it. It's always come raw. But there is a sword in your mouth. That you can use to chisel your word to the shape that you want to see, especially shape consistent with the word of God. Are you following me? You know, people don't know the purpose of the Bible. Reading is the beginning. Speaking is the end. And I'll show you in a while. Why God gave us this word is for a reason. To chisel. Mm. So when God created that, he saw darkness. He began to cut it, cut it, light came. River came, trees came. And the Bible is saying that the words were framed. They were framed by the word of God. What are you framing? Maybe next service, third service, I will go to the prophetic side of the word of God. Now, what people know, there are two sides. I'm dwelling with, I'm dwelling on the first side today. The second side is when, which we want to look at, how do we also operate at this frequency? Elisha stood and he said, about this time tomorrow, a measure of which shall be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley at the gate of Samaria. Can I say that about this time tomorrow, my uncle that is not saved will be saved? Can I say that about this time tomorrow, my rent is paid? Can we also make audacious statements like that? On what, under what condition can a saint speak and attach timing to what you are saying? There is, we are blessed in the name of Jesus. God is doing something in my life. That's what you are building. You cannot tell exactly when it will manifest. When a Christian is sick, I say, by his stripes, I am healed. You cannot tell exactly how long it will take for the health to manifest. It will surely do its 
combination of two factors. How deep your faith is, how well persuaded of the word you are. Uh, 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 that, that's one. But you see, but when the world gets to a prophetic level, it is always about time. So Jesus looked at the fig tree and he said, no man eat of thee again. And life left that tree immediately. Now, can I get to office and look at something terrible and say that tomorrow you shall not be there. Now, every Christian wants to operate this dimension and it is given to us, but there are steps, there are principles, there are things to be obeyed in God's word to break into this other realm. But let's start from this first one. He has said. So, he chiseled the word. Because the word is sword. The Bible says it is sharper. That's what he can trim life from a shape you don't want to the shape that you want. It's sharper than any two edges sword. But this what we are talking about is a living word. Hmm. In Ephesians chapter 6, talking about the old Lamb of God, if we start from verse 10, somewhere around 11, 12, it says, The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. Now, sword is used. You point it at something, cut it. My brother, I am saying that the way life is, normally because of course, it's like if we leave a ground fallow, the, what will come out of it will be weed. Weed has authority to come out of any ground that nothing else is planted upon. Because the earth is on that. So when a child is born, and you listening to me as you grow, the word around you is dark. In Numbers, the Lord told Moses to get 12 spouses. Several things in the Bible, you have to be a Bible scholar to understand. So actually, it sounded then as if God told Moses to elect 12 people to go to promised land, to go and spy the land. It was not God's idea. It was elders told Moses to do that. God only said, well, if that's what they want, do it. But when Moses was talking later in, in Deuteronomy chapter 33, 34, 32, 33, 34, he said, you came to me and asked me to send spies when I already told you that the land has been given to you. And that was a mistake. Because if you put question mark where God has put, if you put comma, or question where God has put full stop, you are in trouble. Are you following me? Okay, so, <laughs> let, let, anyway, so Moses told them to go. Now, can you give me that uh, Numbers 13? I want to call your attention to something very serious there. Hallelujah. I was watching one old video of my message. I didn't even know I said some of these things. If you are not a praying Christian regularly, you always say the wrong things. It sounds simple that the Bible says we offend all. It, uh, uh, the, James 3. But if anyone does not offend the world, the same is a perfect man, able to brand the whole body. See, when the Bible says pray without ceasing, if you don't maintain an attitude of prayer, the word is so dark that in no time you're going to say something wrong. You will say a word of unbelief, a corrupt word, a polluted, you are going to say something. And Jesus said, I do what I seriously judge. There's nothing like I just said. Anytime you open your mouth as a Christian, whatever comes out, adds to eternal life or does something or does a damage. It helps you to walk in victory or it takes you closer to defeat. So there are no neutral words. Jesus said that. So that means words must be used very carefully. If you want to know how important words are to God, Jesus did not see any other name to be except the word of God. When he returns in Revelation chapter 19, the name written on his thigh is the word of God. And that tallies with John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, the word was the God, and the word. It shows you that this almighty does not joke with word. You come to the altar, you say some words, and they call you new creation in heaven. And he said, whatever gives birth to a thing must sustain it. If salvation came by speaking, victory, healing, prosperity will come by... Can I hear me? Where I'm going to end this Hebrew text. Well, I'm just And Moses spoke saying, well, send men down men and search and every time verse. Where he started giving his trust to them going to land. Maybe verse 5. Let's read from 5 or so. Amen. Go to where he told them to go to land. Where they started. Where they were told. Moses sent them. Get you up this southward. Go up to the mountain. 
Verse 18. See the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein. I've shared along this line before. I was in school when God showed me this. Because I was looking at the future. Men and brethren, I will, we will get there where we will see the word of God, not today, as a seed. There is a prophetic part, but what I'm dealing with this service is moral seed. How much of seeds have gone from your mouth to the future? You don't know what happened between David and Goliath. When everything David did to Goliath, he first of all announced, Goliath's authority was cancelled in the spirit before the physical battle, so that one stone could kill a giant. David already told you, you will come against me with spear and sword. But I come against you in the name of the Lord God of Israel, of the army of Israel, whom you defy. He said, today, I will remove your head. But before then, Goliath already said that, I will take your body and feed you to the birds of the air. And David responded. Remember, Isaiah 54, last verse, every tongue that rises against you in judgment. There are many tongues against many Christians, but there are no responses from them. There is no time you relax that Satan is not building cast tools of evil around you. It's up to you to bring it down every now and then. I want you that when you release God's word from your mouth regularly into the atmosphere, you are using the soil to clear every barrier. You just notice that after some few months or some few years, what they call problem is not a problem for you. There is an invisible hand that leads you, that guides you in every step because you have said it. When he told Goliath that I will cut off here, there was no sword David's hand. Leave details to God, it will happen. But declaration must come from you. Are you getting what I'm saying? Yes, this is why you must love the word of God more than concerts. Mm. Ah. <laughs> Let me tell you this. The depth of your prayer is affected by there are people who go to this man, this man, and then they do seven days. They think that when their stomach is empty, God will be impressed. Both God and Satan, they don't eat. So you can't intimidate either of them with fasting. Fasting is scriptural. But you see, don't go and pray without the word of God. After 40 days and 40 nights of fasting and prayer, Jesus only had one answer to Satan. It is written. He never made reference to the fact that I fasted 40 days. Yet I see Christian. They think that if they do 21 days of vigil, that was why like they take taking shock the world. When he healed more people than any other person in his time, and he said that he has never even done three days drive before. Because people think that these things, by strength shall no man prevail. What a scripture will do, seven days drive fasting cannot do. Because forever, oh Lord, thy word is said to not fasting. We fast a lot, I'm not damned. I'm just saying that, put this in perspective. Satan does not fear fast, he fears the world. When you fast to study and pray, eh, hey, you are a threat. Otherwise, people in countries where they are facing hunger should have greater anointing. There are nations where children are dying of hunger. If absence of food, if abstaining from food is what threatens Satan, it shouldn't go to all those places. But I'm saying that, so Jesus for a reason never talked about the fact that he fasted for 40 days. He just looked at Satan and he said, it is written. And when Satan saw that Jesus was using that, it was said, it is written. And Jesus told that it is written again. Thank God for Jesus. Glory to God. No other answer. I have no, no other argument. How is that song? No other answer. You see, base your answer on what Christ has done. Nobody can take it from it and it cannot be improved upon. What we can do or what we have done is little. What he has done is everything. I get what I'm saying. So now, look at this. Pay attention here. And I, I'm ending it. <laughs> I'll just show you Hebrews 13 and then we stop. He says, see the land, the people that dread therein, whether they be strong or weak. Everybody say one. one. Say it loud. One. You know, some people like to be quiet. Say one. one. And when they are watching uh, Asana Mayu, I'm praying. Let's let, let, let just face the word of God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to buy chicken at KFC. If they beat us on that today. Because they reduce how long it will take me to rejoice. I am one of the people praying that their hand will not touch that cup. 
because there are many people in this church who are Arsenal fans and they don't like me. So, you know what? We will not rub it on your face, but we can rub it on your back if you don't win the cup. That day, if you're Arsenal fan, don't come to church. <laughs> if I decide that Man City will win the league, oh, I'll be so happy. And if Arsenal by any chance, if they win the league, retreat will start. So we are not talking about no move football mode. We just close our eyes and pray. We throw ourselves into soul winning, into fasting, into prayer. If I also meet meeting that day, they will not just go and do evangelism. But you see, if they miss that cup, there will be discussion. Topics like how people almost, can almost get there and not be there. <laughs> Topics, you know. We use scripture and let him that thinketh is stand dead. Take heed. Let it fall. Let no man take your crown. All those scriptures like that. That's what we talk about. And they say we will just, I will say it in love. We will just end the way. You don't have to run. We are not going to rub it off. God, Bible says, mourn with those who mourn. Uh, but we can rub it on your back. <laughs> we, we will be merciful, but we'll talk about it. Say lessons of life. How you can be almost, and then we now coin out a prayer from it. Every spirit of almost, almost touching it. <laughs> but if you win, forget about what I've said. Don't remember. Just worship Jesus and give praise to God. <laughs> Amen. Now, whether they be strong or weak, say one. Few or many say two. two. Number three. And what land they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, say four, four. or three. three. What cities they be that they dwell in, whether it be tent or stronghold, say four. four. Next one. What land, whether it be fat or lean, say five. 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 And whether there be wood in it or not, six. Three. What did you notice in all these things as we read them? Imagine... God giving an instruction to Moses. He did not take any definite position about the land. Everything he said was word and opposite. That means the promised land is neither good nor bad. It depends on who is looking at it. And when they got there, 12 of them, 10 said it was a bad land. 2 said it was a good land. They should have looked at the, what the Almighty was showing before them. He is the Almighty. He was the Almighty then, he still the Almighty now. He knew everything. He knew the promise. He could have told them that the land is good. He has said that before. But when he, when he got to them, about to enter, he gave them an option. Call it a good or bad land. You are correct. Whether things are bad in Nigeria or they are not bad, it depends on who is. You know, one day I was coming to the country and I saw the number of whites in the plane with me coming to the country. Why so people are running away? I'm not saying it's wrong. I just wonder. There are nations that are trying to negotiate to take over our country, take over our economy here. Because they see profit here. I'm just saying. Everything begins. Um, be wasting. He said when he first got married, he was always complaining about the wife. And he felt she didn't know how to cook and he was always saying it. It wasn't a good start. But he said that when he started learning the word of God, he began to commend her cooking and her good character. All of a sudden, everything changed. The way he's 70 something now, still happily married. Everything changed. The word of God, you can use it to chisel. Correct what is wrong, amplify what is right. Now, Hebrews 13, 5. I just want to, and then I'm going to close with this. Men and brethren, don't joke with Bible study. Because it is the foundation of knowing what to say. When we say confessing the word, declare, we are not going to be speaking our own words. We are guided by the, for instance, you cannot confess and declare another man's wife to be your wife. I get what I'm saying. God will never go with something that contradicts his word. So there are promises, but they are within the premises of his word. Now look at this. Let your conversation be without covetousness. And be content with such things as you have. Now this is where I'm going, this last part. For he said, 
Everybody said he said. Now, this is Apostle Paul or whoever wrote Hebrew. Hebrew, there's a bit of debate whether Paul wrote to Apollo or someone else. They don't know because there was no introduction of, it just started with God who has sorry time, diverse manner, that time passed to our father by the prophet. So they did not exactly say who wrote Hebrew. But the tone many times will stand like that of Paul. And the revelation of the tabernacle, the blood from chapter 8, 9, 10, 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, only Paul had that kind of revelation of the high priest who has gone to heaven, so like, like, most likely to be Paul. Or somebody well taught by Paul, anyway. So, whoever wrote Hebrews, yeah, <laughs> say, let your course, he said, for he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He's quoting scripture of the Old Testament, or what Jesus said at the end. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Next verse. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do. In other words, let's end this service here. But please, catch me here. The writer of Hebrews said, there is a promise. God said, I will not leave you nor forsake you. He said the reason why he said so is that, so that you can boldly say, I am not afraid. Nobody can. Did you get it? God promised that he won't leave you nor forsake you. That's his own part. You, because of his promise, you must boldly say what he promised. So if the Lord says, I am your shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd. What does that mean? So that you can boldly say, I have a shepherd I shall not want. Did somebody hear what I just said now? That means it's not... I'm not supposed to read the Lord is my shepherd and close the book. He has said is my shepherd I shall not want so that I can boldly stand in my house and say I shall not want because the Lord is my shepherd. That means anything that you find that God has said, that is one side of the equation. You must take it and put it in your mouth and say it boldly. Now, he has said that by his stripes you are healed. Can somebody boldly say, I will never be sick again? Yes. Some have said, but they have not come when I just said. They are still holding back. He has said that the Lord shall supply all your needs according to riches in glory. So that you can boldly say what? All my needs are met. Overflow of blessing. Hallelujah. He has said, we are sanctified. So we can boldly say, loss has no place in me. Boldly say it. The lost of this world, they have no place in me. I treat opposite sex as sisters and mothers. No string at all, no loss. He has said, marriage is honorable. So that we can boldly say, I will not cheat. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. This is how we draw strength from the word of God. Mind you, people will think you are proud. But you know that you are boldly declaring, not on your ability, but what he has said. And faithful is in that promise. He will not. Ah, he, you have a track record of keeping your word. You are not about to stop doing do you have confidence in God? That tells you that the more of what he has said you know, the more of bold declarations you'll be making. This is why you should study the Bible. That's why we started with the book of Lord shall not depart from your mouth. You must keep saying it. Bible definition of meditation is what coming from your mouth. That means you've thought upon it, you've pondered upon it. Now it has become a statement that comes from your mouth. Let's rise. You know you can redesign the story of your family. One misfortune after another. You can redesign. Everybody, they don't last in marriage. People die prematurely. This and this, they happen. Fourth generation. Yet everybody is begging, always need people to help them. Shizu. Redesign, reconfigure. By the word of God. Look for what he has said. And begin to boldly say. That home where there is no joy. You can, re you can redesign it. 
The word of God is a designer. You can redesign it. Oh, glory to God. From a life of sorrow to a life of joy. From a life of defeat to a life of victory. Greater is it that is in you. He has boldly say, he has said so that we can boldly say. He has said so that we can boldly say. Start with the few scriptures you know. Every day when you wake up, say boldly what he has said. That's why you have the Bible in your house. Begin. They are not words of men. The Bible says the word of God is living. Anytime you speak a scripture, something living goes out. And whatever is living, that's the kind of living things, it begins to arrange your life because the word of God is living. It's living. It's living. Nightmare is not your portion. Fear is not your portion. Glory to God. Till it gets to a time when you lose nothing. The Lord keeps promoting you. He keeps opening doors for you. When people see you, they see the light of Jesus on your countenance. In the name of Jesus Christ. For your sake, light is shining in your family. Peace is coming in. Joy is coming in. Grace is multiplied. In the name of Jesus Christ. Your children are walking the right path. Light is shining on your path. Glory to God. Shout and say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pasture. He leads me beside the sea water. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness. For his name's sake, even if I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table. Oh, in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Shout the word, surely. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Somebody give God praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What a service. I am so certain that God has visited you in a very special way and you have testimonies to share. You can do that by sending an email to testimonies at householdofdavid.org. And if you joined the service and you've not given your life to Christ or you're not sure of your relationship with Jesus Christ, I would like to lead you in a very simple prayer. I'd like you to say after me, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I want you to take preeminent control of everything that has to do with me. Become my Lord and become my Savior. Hence, I declare from this moment forward, I am no longer a sinner, but I am a child of God. The Jesus Christ is Lord of my life in Jesus' precious name. Now, if you said that prayer after me, would like you to send an email to the email that is being displayed on the screen and the number, or you can send a text message to the number that you see on the screen. If you'd like to follow us in the household of David, you can visit any of our social media platforms or our website and know a lot more about us. We would also want to know about you and would like to hear from you. Um, till next time, I would like to say keep living in an atmosphere of God's mercies and God bless you. Get ready for a very phenomenal and a remarkable week. God bless you.